So, uh, Christian Ethics, this is the schedule, and you will notice in the middle there's a change. We're going to take a midterm break. Um, the 28th of October, which is a Wednesday, is when we are having the celebration here for our um, Thanksgiving at our church. We have it in between the Canadian and American Thanksgiving. Um, and that's going to be a really hectic week around here. Um, I'm going to be cooking turkeys and we're going to be making all kinds of stuff. I'm going to be busy. A lot of other people are going to be busy. Um, plus, there's there, this is, you know, um, we're, we're a, a lot of other things going on in the church right now. And so I decided we're going to take a midterm break. So the fifth week, so four, four meetings before and three after it, uh, we will not meet the week of uh, the, well, on the 29th, which is the, the day that we would already have met there. Um, I will make every effort to try to get to you prior to that so you can study it. I'm not promising this. But if I can, I will try to get to you prior to that the what you need to know about Christian ethics study sheets so that you will have them during that time so that you can occupy yourself with Christian ethics even if we're not meeting. Um, and there's always reading to catch up on as well, the, the two books. Um, are you enjoying the books? Are the books good? Okay. So you're not going to add that to the end? No. Okay. We're just gonna, <coughs> the courses I've done have been either seven or eight weeks, and as I looked at this, I felt like seven weeks we were so good. So we'll so just have a midterm break in the middle and then still finish on time. Um, so, any questions about any of that? Or any questions from the reading? Usually, the, the, this question came up to me uh, before, and I, I think I've said that this term, but I usually say, um, I typically do not lecture from the books because you can read. You don't need me to tell you what you're reading. Um, there have been some instances where I've done more from the, mater the reading material, like in the, the uh, philosophical theology class, because the book, while it was excellent, it was hard, and people were struggling with it. And so I did more lecturing in that case. Um, in, in this case, today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do quite a bit of stuff from the Stan Grenz books, um, the, you know, the Moral Quest. But I think that both Grenz and um, Glenn Stassen, um, I don't even remember the other guy's name. I know Glenn Stassen because Glenn Stassen was a professor at my college when I was there, Berea College in Kentucky. And then after I was in um, at Fuller Seminary, I left and he came there. So. He was a professor at both my college and my seminary. So him I remember. Um, but I think that both of them are very good, as you know from having read the book. The, uh, Glenn Stassen focuses on the Sermon on the Mount as the, the focal point, the fulcrum of Christian ethics because that is the primary body of ethical teaching from Jesus. Um, I'm not going to get a lot into that. I think he, he makes that case very, very well. I'll get into a few things from him and quite a bit from... Uh, the Stan Grenz book, both of those men died early from cancer, which is unfortunate. You know, Stan Grenz was 55, um, oh. and Glenn Stassen was 60-ish, something like that. But uh, it's a shame to lose them both. They were both great theologians and uh, wonderful people. So this is the course, and John, if you missed that, we are having a midterm break the fifth week, so we will not be meeting on the 29th, so make a note. Um, okay, we've, we've looked at this slide before, but just again to establish the, the basis, ethics or, or moral philosophy, as it's called if you're approaching it from more of a philosophical point of view rather than a sociological point of view, uh, moral philosophy deals with uh, determining the right course of action in human, uh, human life. It's, in terms of a course of study, it systematizes, defends, and recommends concepts of right and wrong behavior. In other words, how should we act in given circumstances? We've all dealt with that, but we need to keep remembering it. Um, the question is, how should we live? What's the right way or the best way for people to live? How should we act in given circumstances? How do we make decisions about what's right and wrong? This is what we're about, and as we talked uh, earlier, ethics is something that every human being does. We, we make ethical decisions every day. Do I stomp on that bug or not? You know. Um, that's an ethical decision, and some people feel very strongly about, about that. So we are always making ethical decisions. Is that, you know, is that uh, dress too risque for this party? You know, um, those are ethical decisions, and we are all ethicists in that regard. And you will remember, and we'll come back to this a little bit later uh, in, the, in the course, not today, that the three major studies within uh, ethics are meta-ethics, which is the philosophical question, the big thing. Where, do, where does even the concept of ethics come from? 
is the idea, uh, that's a meta-ethical question, then normative ethics, what sort of rules or norms or patterns, what do we, what systems do we have for deciding? You know, we talked about deontology, teleology, um, uh, which is consequentialism, and, and virtue ethics. And we're going to talk about those, each one of those, uh, for a week coming up. And then applied ethics, the actual applying of those principles to the decisions that we make, the very real things. Now, last week I had talked, uh, I was going to talk about religious ethics and did not have time to get into it because of all the other exciting things we were doing. Uh, so today I want to spend just a few minutes talking about this. It, it's fascinating to me, the three courses that we have this term, some of you are in all three of them, are Christian ethics, worship, and apologetics to response to the new atheists. And I'm astonished how often I'm finding overlap as I'm preparing for these things. And those of you who are in all three courses will see that some of that as we go along. Um, one of the things, for instance, um, when I say most religions have an ethical component, one of the greatest challenges that the, the new atheists have faced, um, particularly the new atheists, because they, they are so anti-religion, they have an obligation to try to destroy it at every turn. Um, one of the biggest challenges they've had is trying to decide how can we have morality if we have no religion? How can we have morality if we don't believe in any higher power? Where does that moral sense come from? Because they don't deny that everybody has a moral sense. Every human being, as I say, every person is an ethicist. Everybody makes moral decisions. Well, based on what do we make moral decisions? It can't just boil down to, um, if I stomp on that bug, I'll survive, and if I don't, I'll die. You know, it's not just a survival of the fittest kind of thing. So from where does it come? Well, the typical, the traditional, the most common understanding has been that ethical or moral sensibilities come from religious expression. So I want to spend just a few minutes very quickly and talk about some of the different ethical uh, aspects or components of, of some of the major religions. You all will know, all, if you attended any of the Friday lectures I did, you'll know all about these religions. Okay, so I'm not going to get into a lot of detail of explaining to you what Buddhism is, for instance, but let's talk about each of these. In Buddhism, the ethics of Buddhism are based uh, on either the enlightened understanding and teaching of the Buddha, the Talmud Buddha, uh, or else other enlightened beings that followed him. In Buddhism, they have a belief that there are certain people who have achieved enlightenment. Now, Buddhism does not have a, have a perception of God. Uh, true Buddhism, although it, 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 gets, you know, there's, it gets complicated because there are a lot of different flavors of Buddhism, but the tr most traditional version of it did not purport to believe in a divine being. Um, later on, um, Theravada Buddhism and some others, they actually began to present Buddha in such a way that he's virtually worshipped. But there, it's, it's believed that there are other enlightened beings that came after Buddha, um, and Buddha means the enlightened one, that were called bodhisattvas. These are people who have achieved enlightenment in their own life, but out of their generosity, they've decided to stick around and still stay human in order to help everybody else. So the teachings that have come down through, you know, over the, the since 500 BC uh, kind of thing, that from that time period, the various teachings are the basis of uh, Buddhist uh, ethics. They have what's called the Pancasila. The Pancasila are the five concepts, which are seen as the most fundamental principles of ethical behavior in Buddhism which are no killing, no stealing, no lying, no sexual misconduct, and no intoxicants. You don't have wine tasting parties if you're a good Buddhist. Okay? So then that's for the lay people. And all lay Buddhists, all, all people who adhere to Buddhism are, are expected, you know, there's no, there's no ruling council, but it's generally thought that if you're true to your Buddhist beliefs, then you won't do any of those things. You won't steal, you won't lie, you won't kill, you won't have sexual misconduct or intoxicants. But if you are a monk or a nun in the Buddhist faith, there are hundreds of more vows that you take, vows called the Vinaya. All of them based upon the teachings of the Buddha or of people who come after him. Now, very modern Buddhists, especially modern Western Buddhists, are not inclined to want to always go back to ancient documents for that. And so they have, they have in recent times, they've developed much more of a sense of how do we interpret ethical situations based upon the broad principles but with more of a modern sensibility to them. For instance, they will emphasize, rather than the specific ethical teachings, they'll take the broad stroke stuff, like the, 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 the concept of the middle way, not ascetic. The middle way that Buddha advocated was no asceticism, meaning no self-denial, but no luxuriating, okay? no libertine, no, no just doing everything for pleasure. There's a middle way. Not too strict, not too liberal, just right. Okay, that's the middle way. 
And in addition to that, there's the Eightfold Path, which is uh, instructions on how to, how to live the right kind of life from Buddha, you know, which means the first is having right concepts, you know, right, right speech, right, right uh, perceptions, all, all of those kinds of things. Right employment, the kind of job you have makes a difference. So applying some of those things, the Noble Eightfold Path. Um, but in general, Buddhists, along with Jain, the Jain religion, which is a smaller but still uh, evident religion, they focus a lot on nonviolence as a primary. Okay, the no killing, no stealing, the, those are stealing, lying, sexual min misconduct are perceived as all being a kind of violence. You know, you're doing a kind of violence, even intoxicants, you're doing a violence to yourself. And so there's a strong emphasis on that. That's sort of the basis of Buddhist ethics. Not from a divine being, but from beings who are enlightened, who are a step above us. Okay. Then Confucianism and the Neo-Confucianism, the New Confucianism, which isn't all that new by our perspective, it's still been around for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, it emphasizes, instead of teachings that have come down from the past, like Buddhism, it emphasizes relationship. That Confucianism has to do with right relationship, especially to family but that you have, a, you have a responsibility for relationship, maintaining good relationships wherever your place is in society. And so, uh, and interestingly, and this is one way that it conflicts with, say, Christianity, in Confucianism, there is um, a sense in which there is a, an inverse proportionality of the concern you have to show for people based upon how close they are. For instance, you have an absolute obligation to be ethically, um, correct in your relationship with your parents, but you have absolutely no obligation to be ethically correct to a stranger. So the closer they are to you, the more responsibility you have ethically based on a relationship. A stranger is somebody you don't know, you don't have any connection with, you don't have any, you have no responsibility for eth ethic, ethical conduct to them. Mm -hmm. And above all, honesty is valued in Confucianism. Okay? Um, Taoist ethics, Taoism, the belief that there is this evolutionary kind of force that is created and moved through it. Taoism is the way to understand most theists as well. Um, Taoism maintains that there is a force, the Tao, that drives things forward. Um, and because they believe that there's this force that sort of operates everything, Taoists and Confucianists, for that reason, believe that people are inherently good, that they're basically good. This is not a Jewish or a Christian belief. You know, the idea is that we're fallen there. But um, within Taoism, the idea is, since people are basically good, and that there's, you know, the force of nature, the Tao is, is moving along fine, you, the best thing you can do is just stay out of its way, lay low. In fact, to a Taoist, the best kind of leader is the one that's least obviously leading, um, that is being most kind of passive. And that because of that, the Taoists believe that an ethical thing is to get rid of as many of the trappings of society, all of the formality that you can, and just, you know, just uh, be cool. You know, keep on trucking, go with flow, uh, all of those kinds of things are sort of adapted from Taoism. Um, and the ethics means going with things as they are, not trying to create a turbulence, not trying to stand out, etc. Within Hindu ethics, the primary value is the ahimsa, or nonviolence, similar to Jainism and Buddhism. But nonviolence is not just don't fight somebody, it's nonviolence in action, in words, and even in thoughts. This is the highest value in Hinduism. And um, the, the various aspects of the virtue beliefs, that is, ethical beliefs in Hinduism, are called the Dharma. Dharma is the word that they use for virtue, right conduct, right ethics, morality, being the best person you can. And of course they have the principle of, as Buddhism does, because they, adopt, they adapted this from Hinduism, uh, karma, that you know, what goes around comes around, that you will, be, you will receive the, the end results of your own actions. If you do evil, evil will come back to you. If you do good, good will come back to you. So that, the ethical motivation is that this is all going to come back around at some point. Um, but it's believed that you have to voluntarily do this. There can, it's, it's, it's not considered appropriate for any ethical behavior to be imposed upon people within Hinduism. Um, then Islam. Again, I'm giving you this real quick kind of thing, but that you get the idea. Uh, Islam, being one of the monotheistic religions, is similar to Judaism and Christianity in that it maintains that, it is, that God is the source of our ethical beliefs. 
but it's, it differs slightly because uh, Muslim interprets that human beings were granted a moral facility by God, and then they have the obligation to use that correctly. So there's very much a sense, and the very word um, Islam means submission, that we are to submit to God by being obedient to the moral standards that he has implanted in us. Okay? Um, the, and the, the biggest thing that keeps us from doing that is our own ambition and our own material um, obsession. We, what we try to focus on lift, putting ourselves up first rather than being humble, submissive before God and what God has placed in us. And then we also get, get into the trappings of material success. The extreme version of that interpretation is that's why some of the radical Islamists fight against the West. As they say, we are, our materialism has been infiltrating and, and affecting the Muslim countries of the world, and in doing so, we are preventing, especially young people in the Islamic world, from really having the right relationship of submission to God. So materialism is a huge deal to them, and they see us as being the ones that are creating the problem. And then Christian ethics, we're going to obviously be talking about from now on. So I thought if I took 10 minutes and just gave you a survey of the different religions and where they're coming from, uh, some of them, like Islam, uh, have the belief that this is, a sor this is sourced from a divine uh, inclination or teaching or that we have been embedded with a moral sense. Some of them, like Buddhism, it's entirely, uh, or Confucianism, this is how best to get along. You know, this is the right thing to do because we've been taught it from our ancient forebears who were wise or else because this has simply been proven to be most, most satisfactory in terms of relationships. Yes? Where does Hammurabi fit in all of that? Hammurabi? That's long before any, any organized religion. You know, Hammurabi, the, the first Babylonian empire, um, he was the first lawmaker. And it doesn't really fit into any of these religious things because he didn't have a religious motivation. He was politically motivated. But um, that's the first code of law that we know anything about. And he created a code of law that... Um, we sort of would recognize today, and that is, here's what you should do, and if you, if you don't do it, here's the penalty. Okay, very, that's why we call it the first legal code. But that, that existed, you know, along the time of Abraham, or a little before, you know, that's very early. Uh, and it wasn't an ethical issue so much as a political, um, it, it politically expedient approach. This is how he managed his empire, which is... The first Babylonian Empire was one of the very early empires in the world. Yes? On um, top, you say you call it Taoism, the, the Taoism? It's, it's, Taoism. A, it's pronounced Tao, whether Taoism. you spell it with a T or a D. Okay. Um, you said there, there's a force. Is that a force of nature? What is that force? Well, the idea, that is the Tao. That's what it means. That there is some kind of natural flow that exists. It is reflected in the, the physical world, the natural physical world. It's reflected in... The motivations people have, it's what creates our, uh, it's, in fact, by definition, you can't really define it, but, you know, the Tao is that which when sought for cannot be seen or listened for cannot be heard. I mean, they've got all these sort of mysterious things. But it's the idea that there is just some force that's, that is flowing through history and flowing through human interactions and flowing through nature. Um, it's the so thing that pushes nature, us. Human nature, there's nature. All nature. I mean, it's everywhere. The Tao infest, in, 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 infests and manifests in everything, um, the, the evolutionary force is what later people called it. And again, when I say that that's what theism is, the theists, like Thomas Jefferson and Voltaire and various others, uh, they would have said that there is no personal God, but there is some force that was responsible for creating, and, and the, the deists can take one of two approaches. The first one is very Taoist, and that is that it is a non-personal force that um, created, but you can't have a relationship with it because it's not personal. It just continues to work through <coughs> history and through, uh, you know, through the evolution of all things, etc. It's just this force that moves things along. And they sometimes would call it the evolutionary force and capitalize, you know, EF, evolutionary force. That's one version of deism. The other version of deism is that God, even if he was a personal God, and they're not sure, that once he created, he left. And so you can't, you know, he didn't leave a forwarding number. I often say, you know, he's, he went on an extended vacation in of Bayard and we can't reach him, you know. Um, that's the other version of deism, that even if he was personal, he's not available to us anymore. But the first part of that, <clears throat> the idea that there is an evolutionary force that both created and then moves everything along, you know, sort of the providential work of the divine, the Taoists, and 
many theists would say that force, you know, the Taoists would say that is the Tao, the theists would say that is the evolutionary force. It's the same kind of thing. That's something, and it's basically an effort. It's an effort to say something started all this and something is pushing it down the road in terms of all of human existence, but we don't want to give credit to it being a personal anything. It's an impersonal something. Okay, the Tao is not personal. It's just a force. All right. Does that make sense? Okay. We also looked at this slide before in terms of Jewish ethics, and, and we're going to get into a little bit of this today, and that's why I wanted to mention it, that Jewish ethics are the origin of ethical monotheism. That's what they call Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They are the ethical monotheisms. Because prior to this, there was, prior to Judaism, you know, and we're talking here, the call of Abraham, 2000 BC, so uh, 4,000 years ago. Um, the, there was no sense in which religious obligation involved treating people well because you should. You know, you treated people well in order to keep them from hurting you or to keep social order, you know, Hammurabi's code. But the idea of doing, doing it because it was the right thing to do, that there was a moral obligation, did not exist in any religious form until Jewish ethical monotheism was created. It predates Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, which didn't come for 17 years after, you know, they didn't come until Socrates died in 399 BC. You know, so we're looking at 1600 years after Abraham. Um, and the basis for Jewish ethics are first the Torah or the law. And again, that can mean the first five books, the, the Pentateuch, but Torah is often used to refer to the whole Tanakh, which is the whole Hebrew Bible, the whole written Hebrew Bible. Uh, I still haven't taken out an oral there because I, after I first wrote that, I added the halakha. Halakha are the commentaries and the other religious literature like the Talmud. The Talmud is made up of the Mishnah and the Gemara. Um, these are commentaries that, that are, I mean, it's huge. We're talking a, a library full of stuff. And at first they were all oral, and then um, actually after the time of Jesus, they started saying, we better start writing this stuff down because if we don't, we're going to lose it during various persecutions. But then there was a strong influence of, of Greek ethics, that since the Greeks came along far later, but they were very systematic about how they presented ethical ideas, especially as we talked last week, uh, starting with Socrates and then um, uh, Plato, and then, and this is, this is, you know, Socrates was Plato's teacher and Plato was Aristotle's teacher, and then Aristotle was the great systematizer not only of ethics, but of science and everything else. I mean, he's still widely read in every field imaginable today. And so they were so organized in how they presented these ideas that the Jewish uh, theologians began to take Greek thought, and Al after Alexander the Great, there was such an influence of Greek thought, that they began to take Greek thought and merging it with Jewish ethical sensibilities and creating systems. Maimonides, um, the 12th century, the perhaps the greatest of all Jewish thinkers and writers and theologians, he did an interpretation specifically of Aristotle, which became very influential, as I told you last week, that Maimonides' commentary and interpretation of Aristotle became very influential to Thomas Aquinas um, in the 11th century AD. And Thomas Aquinas then was the one who is really the source of all ethical theology in the Catholic Church. All of Catholic ethical thought is based upon Aquinas, which is influenced by Maimonides, who incorporated Jewish and Greek thought. So you begin to see how these things change together. Um, issues of justice, peace, and truth, and of chesed, or loving kindness, are also basic to the Jewish understanding of, of um, ethical conduct. Now, that's all, that's all prelude. That's all stuff we've either talked about before or it's you know, um, prior to today's primary conversation. Today we want to talk about the issue of authority and ethics. That is, from where do we draw our authority for making ethical decisions? Now, in the world today, there are at least six, and we might come up with some more, different sources that, we, that, that people will look to as where they get their ethical um, ideas, their eth the support for their ethical decisions, etc. In order, they are scripture, tradition, um, direct divine guidance, and I, we're talking specifically about Christian ethics here, I should have made that point, conscience, and then obedience to or a modeling from leaders, leadership, and then social pressure or majority acceptance, or some combination of these. 
Okay? Now, for where, where do we get, where do, where do you think Christians typically get their source of authority? The Bible, right? Not really. I mean, that's the first one. But the majority of the Christian world, which isn't Protestant, that's the first thing you need to realize, is that we are the minority. Protestants are not the majority of Christians, even though we don't feel that so much. The Catholic Church, for instance, maintains um, an even balance between the first two of these. Scripture is not the sole authority. Tradition is considered equal in authority. In fact, quoting from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, section 82, number 26, it says, both Scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. By tradition, they mean what they believe to be the God-inspired interpretation of Scripture and the Christian life as reflected by the magisterium. The magisterium means the authorities of the church down through the last 2,000 years. Uh, the definition of magisterium is the bishops in communion with the Bishop of Rome. See, the Pope is just a bishop. There is no higher position technically in the Catholic Church than bishop. Cardinals, the guys who wear the, you know, the red and everything, all they are are bishops who have special assignments. The Pope is only the Bishop of Rome. That's his technical title. So the magisterium, or the authority structure, is defined as the bishops of the Catholic Church in communion with the Bishop of Rome as, as the first among equals. Uh, yes? Oh, um, well, I was raised with this Italian, and I now remember that they said that, um, I don't know if it was in this context, that there was a three-legged stool. Um, it was scripture, tradition, and reason. And so it's kind of similar to the Catholic, of course, this play in this... Right, and the Catholic Church, too, uses reason. Reason, so that was what they said was kind of the foundation. Of right, you would have, that, that tells me you went to a high Anglican church, or a high Episcopal church, very, very, very formal, very liturgical. You probably had the stations of the cross on the walls? Yes. Okay. Uh, I had that when I... Exactly. I think Lutherans had that. We well, went to the Missouri Synod, and it was... <clears throat> I remember that. Well, they, they, they may talk thing. about the fact that we're, we, you know, we benefited from tradition and yes. divine guidance, but Missouri, Missouri Synod Lutheran would not say that they are equal to Scripture. No. Missouri Synod no. Lutheran is the most conservative, well, almost. There's, a, there's some smaller ones, more conservative, of all the Lutherans. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, but the Catholic is the biggest body of the Christian faith. They would maintain that tradition is equal to, and it's in their catechism, that tradition because they believe God inspired this, is equal to Scripture. In addition to that, remember that when we're talking about ethical things, um, the Catholic understanding of Christian ethics comes down from Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas was a philosopher. He, he created natural theology. Natural theology is defined as using human perception and human reason to see the things of God in the natural world. But so really tradition is just saying that's the way we manifest scripture in our lives. That's the way we think it. No, no. Tradition has a technical de definition here. Tradition means what the leaders that have been inspired by God in the past have said. It's not, that's not a matter of me interpreting it. That's a matter of what has God told the popes, the, co the bishops, those who have been in leadership. Yeah. yeah, so tradition means what has come before in the church. Is that why the Catholics for so long spoke Latin in their services and nobody could even understand them and it didn't seem to matter? Well, that's a complicated thing. I mean, there uh, we were talking to all of them. We gave Oliver a ride home from church the other day, and she grew up Catholic, and she said that when she was young, they said they told people, her and others, don't read the Bible. Because oh, yeah. you won't understand it. You have to get it all from me. Exactly. Even when they were not even speaking your language, which to me meant yeah. right. so bizarre. Well, what that what that that is that does reflect the Catholic <coughs> attempt to try to balance scripture and tradition, and though scripture and the leadership of the church, because scripture was to be interpreted by the leaders of the church. Right. Right. And you know, whereas when you get to the Protestant Reformation, one of the great cries of the Protestant Reformation, along with you know. Um, sola gratia anyway, that grace alone, um, and faith alone, sola fide, was sola scriptura, scripture alone. So one of the major things that the Protestant Reformation did was it rejected the idea that the words or thoughts of men, even though they claimed to be inspired by God, the tradition of the magisterium was not equal to scripture. 
That was one of the biggest breaks, and it is it's to this day, that is the most fundamental difference of all. There are some other differences, but that's the biggest difference between Catholic and Protestant. So, but you need to understand that so scripture, tradition, and then, you know, divine guidance, if you would, um, all of that are part of even the Christian tradition of where do we look for ethical authority. Now, if you move on down, you know, the Protestant reformers emphasize scripture alone, sola scriptura, as being the source. But even within the Protestant world, there are some differences. Lutherans and Reformed, that is, we're Reformed, Presbyterians, you know, are the Reformed tradition. The Lutheran and Reformed tradition, which together make up the majority of, of, um, of, of evangelicals, at least, in America, okay, um, they are typically, the focus is on Scripture. You know, that's our source. That's why all of you said, when I said, what's, you know, what, what, what's our primary source? Scripture, right? Um, but, if you go back to some of the other Protestant traditions, like the Methodist tradition, uh, via John Wesley, John Wesley pr proposed what they, is today known as the Wesleyan Quadrangle, which was scripture, tradition, <coughs> reason, and experience, all four. So there was more of an emphasis on reason and experience. And it's interesting, Methodism, when John Wesley said, you know, pr presented that, he was an Anglican. John Wesley never left the Anglican church. He did not want to start a new church. It was all the people that, you know, that came to the faith that came up uh, from his teaching. They're the ones that created the, the, what, the Methodist church. But it came out of Anglicanism, and he was never willing to split with Anglicanism. So you see a little bit of that in terms of the, you know, the high Anglican, the idea well, of... The Anglicans had the stool, and he's got a chair. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's a little more stable. Then you end up with some other Protestant traditions, like the Pietists and the Quakers. They emphasize a lot more direct divine guidance via the use of prayer and other spiritual disciplines that God will speak. This is one of the reasons why there have been a number of sort of uh, wacky kind of sect movements that have come out of pietism and, and some of the others is because they are more inclined to think that God will speak to the people today and that that has authority. Um, you, similar to that, Pentecostal and Charismatic believers have had a tendency to emphasize ecstatic religious experiences as a way to gain insight into how to live. And again, that's why there have been some people in, in those traditions, and I'm not speaking ill of those traditions, I'm talking historically, why there have been some people you know, have, who've gone off the rails a little bit because of the emphasis on more the ecstatic experience as being a way to gain insight. Now, modern trends, um, and, and I should say, by the way, that when you look at these things, three, four, five, and six, most evangelicals, most either, either Catholics or Protestants who are serious about their faith, have a real concern about that. And the primary concern is that those last four are, um, are potentially subject to a very radical subjectivity. They have to do with how a person interprets things themselves. Whereas scripture, and yes, there's interpretation of scripture, but the words are there, okay? And you may misinterpret them, or somebody may try to twist them, but somebody can always go, wait a minute, let's come back to this. Um, same thing with tradition. When we talk about tradition being what has come before and was written down, but whenever you get into direct divine guidance or personal conscience or obedience to leaders, you know, which leader, or social pressure and majority acceptance, those things can, can be heavily affected by subjective determination. Here's what I think, right? Every, every cult, every, it's because we're talking about Christian ethics, every pseudo-Christian cult that has ever come along has been somebody who said God has spoken to me or given me insight or given me guidance that nobody else has had. You know, Joseph Smith, um, uh, Charles Taze Russell, who started Jehovah's Witnesses, or on and on, okay? Um, Christian Science, Mary Baker Eddy, all of those started with somebody saying that God had given them a unique and so it was their subjective interpretation of that. Um, nowadays, the modern trend in ethics, even among Christians, and that those of a more liberal bent in Christianity, are uh, focused on two aspects. And often these days, without even being aware of it in some cases, these two aspects are elevated even above the level of authority of Scripture. And those aspects would be first, an emphasis on finding of the social and <coughs> the findings of the social and natural sciences in shaping moral teaching. Okay, what has science, social sciences, natural sciences, what are what have they told us that we need to take into account? Example would be 
when the abort they don't they, they don't argue about this part of it anymore but for a long time in the abortion debate <coughs> what was the, what was the primary point they were arguing about early on in the abortion debate when 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 is a fetus a real person <coughs> that's a science question and a lot of people made their ethical decision based upon that that's an example of using the findings of natural sciences or in some case social sciences um, Similarly, some people, when you get to the question of homosexual practice, the social sciences argue, uh, have argued for years over, is this something that's inherited a person, or is it, you know, or is it something they learn? Okay, is it nature or is it nurture? That's a social science question, and some people make their ethical decision based upon that. You see how that works. A second aspect uh, of these two major aspects that modern trends uh, are in ethics are a focus on human experience especially in listening to the voices of people that may be seen as the oppressed or the broken. Similarly, the question of homosexuality, you know, the, that there have been, you know, that gay people have been oppressed, they're not being given their freedom, they need to have a voice, that becomes for some a much more important consideration than what scripture says. And I'm not saying that those are not, you know, that the social and, and natural sciences or the voice of the people, you know, with regard to these things. I'm not saying that they have no impact whatsoever. The question is, what's the balance here with regard to what has authority for us? What do we rely most on? So you begin to see, and there are a lot of Christians. I mean, I, when we've talked about some of these issues, you know, we've studied, we've done Bible study, and we got the passage in Romans 1 that, you know, refers to homosexual behavior. And I can still see somebody raises their hand and said, yeah, but science has now proven that people don't decide that. They're born that way. Now, for the person that said that, that's a major ethical consideration, right? More important to the person who said that than what the scripture said, because they said it in response to, you know, and as a counter to what we were reading in Romans 1. So you see that these things are very different kinds of um, effects in terms of people's, people's perceptions. Yes? Uh, in light of these six things, um, I... Doesn't authority have to be absolute to be authority? You're speaking as a deontologist. The, no, the, no, I'm, the I'm, reason I'm, we're studying no, this... I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, drawing, I'm drawing a difference between number one and two through six. In order to be there to, for there to be an authority, it has to occupy a place unequal. Wouldn't that be logical? Well, I agree with the first thing you said and not the second thing. <coughs> You know, I don't think we can say, logically, you have to believe that, because a lot of people of goodwill who are very smart don't agree with that. Well, then authority cannot be authority. I mean, what, what authority, but you think there's authority in one part, but there's not a, a different authority in another part? Well, the authority. Catholic Church says there's authority both in Scripture and tradition. Some of the other Christian traditions say there is authority in divine guidance. What is God speaking to me or to us as a body right now? Some would say that there is authority in, in you know. I, I understand that, but my point is, my point is, is that for you to declare this is authority, it seems logically that that would have to occupy a place by itself. Well, you, you're, what you're describing is absolute authority, and some people would do, see you, you've taken a step to absolute authority. It's like when we talk about faith in the apologetics things last week. The difference in faith and blind faith, and the the the, the eight new atheists say that all faith is, you know, uh, in contrary to evidence and illogical and irrational. But what they're describing is what historically has been called blind faith, and there's a difference. So the difference in authority and absolute authority, we need to be clear about that. Carolyn? For example, scripture and tradition don't necessarily conflict. That's right. That's so right. That's true. I, I think that you can have both as authority if they, you know, when they don't conflict. If, if at some point they do, then you have to choose. Then you have to choose. And I'm going to be, I'm going to be arguing that our first and absolute source of authority is scripture. It is number one. So our, uh, above all else, it trumps everything else. Okay, in fact, when I've done our new members class, I talk about the fact that Christianity, um, like Judaism, and purportedly, like Islam, are revealed religions. Meaning, it's not just that somebody looked around and said, well, how do I explain thunder? And they came up with the idea of a, you know, of a god of thunder. But rather that this was given to us, in, in specifically in detail, it was revealed to us. Well, in that process, there's four aspects that we experience of revelation today. There's revelation in Scripture. You know, there is revelation in the history of the church, for instance, as reflected in the creeds. 
there is revelation that exists in, um, in the body. You know, what is God saying to us? We believe that God reveals his will through our board of uh, elders, our session in our church. And there is the, there's the revelation of the natural revelation. What do we see in nature? The point is, in that, while there's four different aspects of revelation, the first one, they're in a or, descending order of authority, you know, and actually the, the, the third one is the natural revelation. That is, the revelation of Scripture has authority over the others. Scripture is the absolute authority. If, in, if the others agree with them, fine. But if they disagree with them, then you back up a step and go, no, wait a minute. You know, I don't care what, what the session thinks God is telling them. If it's contrary to Scripture, we don't say it. I don't care what the history of the church has said. If it is contrary to Scripture, then somebody went wrong. All right? So, we believe there is an absolute authority. But that's not to say there is not some authority that we need to recognize. And one of the reasons we're looking at this is because, as I say, there are people in our church who I know are Christians, love Jesus, and yet they, they don't recognize that we do have to make decisions about which of the potential authority sources we have are going to be most compelling to us. And all of them are sources of authority. The question is how do they relate to one another, and are there some of them, you know, which ones are absolutely valid, which ones are perhaps not valid. Okay. But they're all a source of authority, just for not, perhaps not absolute authority. Does that make sense? Okay. You may not agree, but does that make sense? All right? Um, and by the way, we, we do need to remember, too, that this is a, these classes are academic classes. I mean, when I talk about histories of stuff, um, they're not devotional in their orientation. I'm giving, we have to have a broad understanding, a broad foundation, even if they're not all the things that we as, you know, as evangelical Christians or whatever might maintain, we still need to understand where other people are coming from too, and that's why we do present some things that may not be our basis. But with that understanding, what is the issue of authority for Christian ethics for us? So the question, what should be the sources of authority, source or sources of authority for Christian ethics? That is, from where should Christians derive needed insight and direction for shaping their ethics, right? Where do we look to decide what's right, what's not right? Okay. How should we properly invoke and interpret Scripture with regard to Christian ethics? All right. It's very, you know, we can say, well, we look to the Bible. And that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to, in fact, I'll give you the rest of this. As looking to answer these questions, we must first consider the Old Testament as prophetic and biblical tradition of the people of Israel. And secondly, consider the New Testament witness, especially as it records the teaching and practice of Jesus. So we're going to be focusing on Scriptures but today and at least one more week in the future. Um, but even that, the Old Testament tells us to stone witches. Do we, should we do that? I mean, there are people in this town that practice Wicca, which is modern version of witchcraft. Should we get all of our Christian friends together and drag them out of their houses with pitchforks and torches and stone them to death? Or is there not some other authoritative value that we must apply to our interpretation of that? I mean, it says that children who disobey their parents should be killed. Place. Should we do that? You know, if they're disobedient? Um, homosexuals should be killed. In fact, anybody who denies the true faith, you know, anybody who is heretical in their belief should be killed. That's all in the Bible. We have to have some sense of, in, in, when I say need an insight and direction for shaping our ethics, what do we use to invoke and interpret Scripture? There is some other standards. Now, it's not whatever. It's not Katie bar the door, whatever you think. Whatever feels right to you. That is not Christianity. We do have to have some sense of authority. But it's not as simple as just saying we do what the Bible says. It is more complicated than that. And we all know that. There are things in Scripture that we don't do. Because we don't believe that they apply to us anymore. But how do we evaluate this? How do we interpret that? Okay? That's the Christian ethical challenge. Based on what? And so, when we consider the Old Testament, when we, and then the New Testament especially, what, what is our process for evaluating those things? Now, um, a lot of people assume, I'm, I'm going I'm to talk now about the Hebrew Scriptures, and before I get into that, a lot of people assume that the Hebrew Scriptures are all about just law. God said, do this, don't do this. If you do this, you'll be blessed. If you don't do this, you'll get nuked. That is simply not the case. That is not 
the premise. It's not just a set of rules, and you obey the rules and things will go good, you disobey the rules and things will go bad. In fact, that was the entire problem that the Jewish authorities in Jesus' day had. This is the thing that Jesus took exception to, is they thought an absolute rigid um, adherence to the legal letter of the Jewish law was, was what they needed to be righteous. And Jesus said, you guys are completely missing it. You are, you know, hard-hearted, stiff-necked, whitewashed sepulchers. <clears throat> pretty, pretty hard words he had for them. So we need to understand that the Old Testament scripture, right, any of scripture, um, but especially the Old Testament, is not simply a collection of prescriptive instructions, meaning a, that we, a, a, like a prescription you get from the doctor, a set, of, a set of directions, this is what you must do, this is how you must move forward, um, what you can do and what you can't do. There are commands, there are things that it tells us to do, and some of them are prescriptive. But it gets more subtle than that, because some of the, there are 613 commandments in the Old Testament. 613 mitzvot, as they're called. Christians today don't obey all 613 of those, and we feel fine about that. But based on what do we decide what we obey and what we don't? See, some people make the decisions that, you know, um, you, I am the Lord your God, you will worship me only. Well, God didn't really mean that. You know, Jesus is not the only way to God. Christians will say that. Carolyn has heard a priest of an Anglican church, an Episcopal church in Seattle, say that from the pulpit. So where do we draw the line? How do we decide? Yeah. What's the difference between um, you have the Hasidic Jews, you have the Reformed Jews, you have all these also, just like the Protestants, I suppose, all these different groups. So do the Reformed Jews also say, well, 613 is too many, we're not going to do all those? I mean, how do they parse that? It's, it's very complicated. It is very much like the difference between uh, sects or groups within the Christian faith. Um, in terms, and it's, much of it turns out to be a, an interpretive issue. Uh, is some around of, the laws, though? Or well, they, they would all, ex for instance, they all accept that, that the Torah, the first five books, are God's word to them, but they have various levels of, of application of more modern sensibilities to it. <coughs> you have, um, you have the, the, conserv the um, not conservative, the Hasidic Jews, the Orthodox Jews, and then the, a large development of what was called the Reformed Jews, and then the conservative Jewish movement came along as an effort to try to go in between those. And there's even an atheistic Jewish movement, which believes that to be a Jew is to follow the traditions and to be genetically Jewish, but to follow the traditions, but that God doesn't have anything to do with it. So there's a wide range. Um, I could go off on that a long time. That's so not it's not funny. around laws that they disagree or have differences? Well, that would be part of it. Yes, John. In the same way, wouldn't that be what we're talking about here, be an interpretive issue rather than an ethic issue? Well, but ethics is an interpretive issue. Well, what comes first, ethics or interpretation? Well, we're going to get into that a little bit, because the issue of ethics or theology is what basically, you know, is another way of saying ethics or interpretation. Yes? Uh, when, I, when I went to a uh, Jewish synagogue, uh, you know, synagogue, the rabbi had an enormous library to interpret. It was, it was, it was like a law library. Mm -hmm. I was a lawyer. I, I, I really was a Astounded by the, the depth of interpretation and study. Right. Well, that's that's universally true of Judaism. Uh, in fact, the reason why, from a very young age, boys were sent to yeshiva to a Jewish school is to learn interpretation. And they're studying the Torah and the Talmud. And in the Talmud, there are the writings of Hillel and of Akiva and of various others, you know, Ben Simon, and various other major rabbis and theologians. How many of you guys remember the movie Yentl? Did you see Yentl? There's one scene in that movie where they're on their way, they're right in the back of this cart, and they're on their way to the new term at the yeshiva, and the boys are looking at the Talmud, and they're arguing from different rabbis, when does the day begin and end? You know, well, the day begins when you can see your shadow, you know, according to Akiva or whatever. And no, the day begins when you, uh, the, the, it, it begins when you can begin to discern the outline of things at a distance and all that. And so this interpretive thing is huge. That's why the Talmud is, you know, a library full of stuff. Um, yeah, but the, the important thing for us to understand as we talk about Hebrew scripture is that the Hebrew scripture is not, as many people mistakenly believe, just a set of rules. 
the ethics of the Old Testament, the ethics of the Bible as it begins in the Old Testament, is in the context of a narrative. It is presented to us as a story. And the truths that we derive come out of the story. And that story, which, by the way, the same thing is true for Christian ethic and scripture. You know, the Bible is a story for us. And so we have to decide in, in, in what way to interpret the ethical truths that are contained in the story of the Old Testament and New Testament. We're going to focus first on Old Testament. Um, before I get into that, we're going to talk about morality and Hebrew scriptures. Let's go ahead and take our break right now. So we talked about the fact that if we believe scripture is our ultimate authority. It is the, you know, beyond all other aspects of authority or revelation that it is foremost as God's word to us. And so, but how do we interpret it, as I said uh, before the break? Let's start with Hebrew scripture. Let's talk about morality in Hebrew scripture. This is all linked to the, rea to the truth that um, the Old Testament is not just a set of rules. The Old Testament is a story, that it is a narrative of, how, of God relating to his people. And the church, the Christian church, came out of the ancient people of Israel and saw themselves an, as an extension of that Old Testament story. That Jesus was God continuing his plan by sending his son and that that constituted a new and higher level of human history. But it was a continuation. Uh, the early Christians were all Jews. I mean, the, the, first, the first record we have of non-Jews or Gentiles becoming Christian are Cornelius, the centurion, Roman centurion and his family. And then later on, uh, people in Antioch were Paul and, um, and Barnabas were. And they sort of started the church there, and they were Gentiles. And it led to, in Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council, which had to decide, does somebody have to become a Jew in order to be a follower of Jesus? That's how Jewish they were. Um, since that time, you know, I, most of you know, I've, I've worked with Jews for Jesus, uh, some of the Messianic organizations, that is, Jewish Christian organizations. Their whole message is that, that Christianity, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and the Christian faith is a natural extension of Judaism. And so, therefore, it should be a natural thing for Jewish people, if they understand it correctly, to accept. So, we are, our roots as Christians are in the Jewish story, are in the Old Testament Hebrew story. Um, I've known of ministers who refuse to preach from the Old Testament, and that's, that's a heresy. You know, that's, that's a complete denial of the truth of who and what we are. The Old Testament is our Bible, too. Um, the Hebrew Bible. Um, but we need to realize, as you look at the, at the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, there really is no such thing as an Old Testament ethics in any kind of, in any way that the Greeks, for instance, would recognize. There is no abstract philosophical sense in which there is an Old Testament um, theology. In, in, in Scripture, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, there are no philosophical discourses on morality. The closest thing we get to there is Ecclesiastes, you know, as he's struggling to find out the meaning of life. But for the most part, again, it's, it's a story. There's, it's not abstract, it's concrete. It's a telling of a real uh, set of experiences that lasted from the creation, you know, the first, uh, the first uh, 11 chapters of the Old Testament, to the introduction of Abraham, and then moving on from there, Abraham being the father of the Hebrew people. So we can't look at the Old Testament as a, an ethics um, textbook. You have to have some interpretive approach to it because it is not, in a, in a philosophical sense, a moral theology, a moral philosophy document. And because of that, the ancient Hebrews did not have any kind of codified theoretical system of ethics. They they didn't think that way. They didn't do that. That's why when you get Jewish theologians and philosophers like Maimonides and others who come along, they take the Jewish ethical sensibilities that come out of the Old Testament narrative um, and they add to it the sort of systematic philosophical approach that the Greeks had in order to be able to have some structure to it. The Greek philosophical approach gave structure to the Jewish ethical sensibility and that's why there was that combination. Well what we have is a story and it's a story of a people who are called forth by God to become the chosen people of God in the world. Old uh, the Old Testament ethics grew out of that story of God calling forth a people and giving his instructions to them as to how they were to be in a relationship with him. 
And that's what it meant to be the Hebrew people. So we need to understand that, that we're dealing with a narrative here. But the, the theme of that narrative is covenant relationship. The covenant relationship between the people, the Hebrew people, the Israelites, and God is the foundation for any kind of interpretation we might have of ethics or the ethical life that we find in the Hebrew Bible or for the Hebrew people. Covenant relationship. And again, be listening as we go along with this because you can hear how in Jesus' time he was calling the Jewish leaders so much to task that they didn't get the relationship part, that everything was based upon this covenant relationship and that you guys, have, you, the Jewish leaders in Jesus' day, had fallen to the point where they thought, if I obey all the rules, if I can check off all the boxes, I'm good. Even if I do it reluctantly or with a slave mentality or, you know, whatever. And Jesus is saying, no, you guys have forgotten that all of this is based upon a relationship, the relationship of the Jewish people with God. Everything has to be seen in that context. And that was what Jewish, what Jesus had such a problem with him about. Covenant for the Jewish, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, meant their conviction that Israel had been called into a unique relationship. Of all the peoples of the world, um, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, were called to be his one chosen people. And that, the uniqueness of that relationship is the context in which any Jewish ethical sensibilities are developed. Right? Now that begins <clears throat> all the way back with the creation of the earth. You know, God creating the world, and then um, it is reflected in the creation of Adam and Eve. That is then renewed with Noah. And here, we're, all of that's in the first 11 chapters. And then we have the introduction of Abraham. And Abraham is called to God. And there is articulated uh, the most specifically, or initially the most specifically, what the relationship is going to be between God and his chosen people. You know, I will be your God, you will be my people. Go where I send you. Follow me, and I will make of you a great people. I will give you a land to be your own, and through you, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. That was the promise. That was the arrangement. All of it based on relationship. You're my guy. I'm your God. I will be, I will see to it you, you produce a great people. <coughs> then later, of course, we, 500 years later, we have Moses. We have the great example of God's unique providential care of the Hebrew people through the Exodus, and then the giving of the law. Um, and I'm going to talk in a few minutes about a um, thing that even most Christians don't realize. When I talk about this, people are shocked because they've never thought about it. Um, God called Abraham as being the father of the Jewish people, and he established his covenant relationship with Abraham and with his descendants. There was no law for 500 years until Moses comes along. The only thing that God said is, go where, I, go where I tell you to go. And then later he introduced circumcision so that every Jewish male, every descendant, every part of Abraham's household or descent, they would carry on their bodies a sign of the fact that they were one of the chosen people of God. There were no other rules. Nothing else for 500 years. It wasn't until Moses that the law was introduced. And yet by the time of Jesus... They thought that the law was the whole thing. It was all about the law because they had forgotten the relationship that came earlier and that's, that was the basis on which the law was given. Make sense? Most people think the story of the Jews is the story of the law. It is not. Okay. That's only one aspect of it. Um, and the relationship was a unique relationship. Nobody else got to participate in it. And the other thing about it is... It was entirely, the relationship was based entirely upon God's divine grace. It was a unilateral offer. It was not, again, contrary to what the Jewish leaders in Jesus' time said, and most, most Christians these days, for instance, it was not a matter that if they were worthy, if they, if they followed all the rules sufficiently well, then they would be in relationship with God. God declared that he was establishing a relationship based upon his divine grace. Unilateral action on God's part. And it was only to be in response to that, in gratitude, that they were to be obedient in order that they might be more holy in the way God is holy. 
the, the unilateral outpouring of God's grace, it should be grace, not grace, sorry, um, left Israel with certain obligations. God had done everything for them. So what, what should they do in response to that covenant relationship? The response was that they were called to be holy even as God is holy. God said, I want you to be more like me. And when, after 500 years, they were having trouble figuring out exactly what that meant, God gave them the law and said, this is what it would look like for you to be holy in the way that I am holy. With the full expectation that they, probably, they would never be able to achieve that. When Jesus said, be perfect as your Father in heaven, even as your Father in heaven is perfect, he doesn't expect us actually to be perfect. But he expects us, us to seek to be as much like God as we can. And in our case, as much like Jesus as we can. The, the, the practical example of God having become human and having dealt with all the things we deal with. But this unilateral act by God is the thing that gives all of the foundation, all of the basis for the Jewish people. Um, and that particularly is reflected, the act in which that was reflected more than any other was the Exodus. The Exodus is the most important event in the history of the Hebrew people. Challenge, you know, or perhaps the call of Abraham being the only thing that's close to that. Um, because in the Exodus, God uh, called the people up out of slavery in Egypt. He miraculously uh, redeemed them, brought them out of slavery, and then it was in that act that through Moses he gave the law, his set of instructions. But from that point on, every time God wants to get their attention or wants to present them with his will, Almost every circumstance, it starts out like before the Ten Commandments were given. The start of the Ten Commandments, Exodus 22, says, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. This great redemptive act of God for the Hebrews became the high point of his unilateral action on their behalf to demonstrate that they were his uniquely chosen people. And that became the most important event in the Jewish psyche from that point on because of that. Now, um, Walter Kaiser is an Old Testament scholar and he has said, Old Testament ethics is concerned with the manner of life, is, is considered more with the manner of life than with the older covenant prescriptions and approvals. It is how they were to have lived in response to covenant, not are they following the rules. This is exactly what comes down uh, through Jesus. So holiness is being obedient to God in response to the covenant relationship. It's all about the relationship. And the Israelites were always forgetting that. They were always getting into trouble because they would forget everything that God had done for them. Making them his covenant people. Blessing them. Bringing them up out of slavery. They would worship other gods. They would do abominable actions because they forgot that it wasn't even about obeying a set of rules, which they weren't very good at that either. But it was about relationships. And they forget it over and over and over again. So the ethical consequences of covenant relationship is that it was required that the Israelites be obedient to God. And that means that they would separate themselves from everything that is profane and defiled. Um, they were to be holy. Now again, this was only one part of it. They were, they were to keep themselves from being defiled, to be unholy, to uh, be made unclean by the things of the world. That's why there's all these cleanliness things, why there's kosher law, why there's, you know, you don't touch a dead body, you, know, you, you don't touch a woman during her menstrual period, you, you know, all of these things. These were sort of visual um, teaching symbols that God used for them to understand you're not supposed to be like everybody else because you're in relationship with me, the one true God. But in addition to not being, allowing themselves to be profaned and defiled, which they got really, you know, that became their whole focus, they, God instructed them that they also had to be upright in their human interactions. This is where the ethical part comes in. In their family life, in commerce, how they ran their business, in their concern for the less fortunate, in their limits on vengeance, their truthfulness, and even their proper treatment of animals. Um, we, you think about all the sacrifice of the Old Testament, and yet there are instructions in Deuteronomy uh, about what to do if you find an animal that's wandering around. You feed it, you take it home, you take care of it until you can find out who owned it. It even says, 
if you're walking along and you find a bird's nest there with a mother sitting on her eggs or on her young, you can't take the mother. It says you can actually take the eggs or you can take the young, but you must release the mother. All right. Very specific instructions about concern for animals, both domestic animals and wild animals. Um, and very, very explicit instructions about being honest in your business practices, etc. Um, it's also true that there was no division in the Old Testament between religious life and daily life. God is very clear to say that if you're going on the, if you're going to worship me on the Sabbath and come before my presence and be in a relationship with me, you have to also live your life the right way during the rest of the week in relationship with me and in right ethical conduct. In other words, you can't only have obeyed the rules and therefore have a clean heart, if you will. You also have to have clean hands. It's not just that you are my people in relationship with me. You have to act right. And that includes how you act toward other people. Um, holiness, God called them to be holy. Holiness was not just blind obedience to impose laws, but it was the responsibility that they, they accepted as being the recipient of divine grace. That was their half of the equation. God unilaterally did all this for them. Their response was to be holy. And their response, their holiness, was what marked them as being distinct. It marked them as being different than all the other nations, because there were a lot of other nations around at that time. They had a responsibility. Now, it's important to note, too, that at no time, again, they got, they got this wrong a lot, especially in Jesus' time, at no time was it uh, communicated that it was by means of the law that the, the Jews would become the people of God. By fiat, by God's word, they had already become the people of God. The law was instructions by which they could live out what it meant to already be the people of God. You see the difference? We use, I've used the analogy a lot of times for Christians. It's not that you need to be good so that God can love you. It's that you need to let God love you so that you can be good. That's exactly what the Hebrew issue was. They thought, if I'm good, if I obey all the rules, then I'm in good with God. And that was backwards. The fact is, God had already taken all the action to make them his people, to make them the, the holy, righteous people of God, but now they had to act like it. Right? You see the important difference there. Um, <clears throat> Again, Walter Kaiser, I quoted a minute ago, said, The covenant aimed to establish a personal relationship, not a code of conduct in the abstract. It was relationship. It was the relationship that was important. The conduct, how they acted, simply reflected that relationship. It came after the fact, if they, got it, if they understood it right. They didn't always understand it right, and so they didn't always perceive it that way. Now, and again, you can think about all the things that Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees. Right? God, you know, God does not desire your sacrifice. God desires you know, your heart. And on and on and on, and all of his interactions with them. This is exactly what he's saying. It's not following the rules that God wants. God wants you to love him, to be in a relationship with him, to have a right heart. The rest of this stuff is just how you then live your life in, in fulfillment of that. Um, so the pattern of their lives should be according to the holiness and righteousness of God with whom they were in relationship to be like God in how they live nowadays as Christians we talk about Christ likeness you know, that our goal is, and it's the same thing you know, they, they were seeking to be like God in terms of being holy as he defined holiness because of what he had done because of what Jesus has done for us we seek to be more like him we seek to be more holy as the Holy Spirit gives us the ability, as Jesus demonstrated it for us. Now, this whole covenant theme that God chose to enter into a relationship with Israel establishes the theological foundation for understanding ethics in the Old Testament. In fact, that is the theological theme of the Old Testament. If somebody asks you ever, well, what's the Old Testament about? It's about the fact that God acted first to create a relationship with a people, the Hebrew people. And then the rest of the story is either their willingness to fulfill what that meant to be a holy people or not. And the various events related to that history. 
But the theme is, God acted in adopting these people and making them his own, and then instructed them, here's how you now should act in response to being in relationship with the Holy God. Um, now that, um, the wisdom theme, I mean, we talk about the wisdom literature in Scripture, you know, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. Uh, most particularly, Proverbs is all about wisdom. Okay, that's the theme of that's what there. It's called the wisdom literature. Well, wisdom as a theme in the Old Testament is prominent, not just in those books, but elsewhere. And wisdom in the Old Testament is understood as knowing the proper way to live and then living that way. That's what wisdom meant to, to in the Old Testament. That's what the wisdom literature is all about. God has revealed His character. He's shown the Israelites what it is to be good and holy, and wisdom is to recognize that and then do it, for heaven's sake. All in a as a reflection of relationship. Now, likewise, in terms of relationship with the holy God, God is defined very clearly. He reveals his divine character. And another major theme uh, related to that in the Old Testament is what God is like, that he is the compassionate God. God is often described as being compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. These people who say, well, the Old Testament is all about judgment and God's anger, and the New Testament is about love and light and grace and mercy. Those people either have never read the Old Testament or they weren't paying attention. It is in the Old Testament that God is described as being compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And the point is that he loved the Hebrew people, they, he bound himself to them, he acted in grace in supporting them in the Exodus and many other ways, and then they defiled themselves, they, they denied him, and God would necessarily punish them, and then he would invite them back, and they would, they would betray him, and he would invite them back, and they would betray him, and he would invite them back, talking about love. That's the story of the Old Testament, and it's all in the context of that relationship becomes the foundation on which ethical conduct is built as well. Um, the fact that relationship was first, again, we, when we get to New Testament conversation, we, we can see so much in Jesus. You remember, Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that kingdom of God means relationship, because Jesus was the kingdom incarnate. So seek first the relationship... God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be given to you. All the rest of it comes after the relationship. Seek God first, and then the rest of the stuff will fall into place. You get that part right, and everything else will make sense, and it will happen in a natural order. When you get those things backwards, or you, do, you forget about the relationship altogether, that's when you run into problems. <coughs> and that's something that the Greeks could not understand. See, the Greeks had this idea that um, ethics, or the pursuit of virtue, meant you decide what needs to be done, and you exert your own energy and efforts in order to try to accomplish that through the practicing of virtues, and there's a discipline involved. Well, there were disciplines involved in, for the Hebrews as well, but they were all entirely based upon first the relationship. It wasn't up to you. Um, it's not... Um, it's not about you and what you want and what you've done. It's about God and what he's done and what he wants and then how we respond to that. Now, still, you know, the Hebrews had lots of problems. Sin needs to be seen as not failing to keep a rule, but rather failure in relationship. That is how sin is understood in Scripture. And that's both the Old and the New Testament. Yes, it, in fact, you might, you might define this as being sin with a capital S is, bless you, is, is a violation of the relationship with God. And that then results in sins with a small s, which are the actual things you do that you shouldn't. But all of that is just simply symptoms that come out from the large sin, which is a failure of relationship. Um, God was the standard for holiness. And because they continually failed at that, that meeting that standard, at, at being holy as God is holy, as, as maintaining that relationship in the way that it should be, the Israelites developed a profound sense of their own failure. 
uh, and we find that read. Uh, there are some places where it's real obvious, like I mentioned the book of Ecclesiastes, where the, the Solomon, if he was the author of Ecclesiastes, and it, it <coughs> suggests that he was, um, he goes about trying to find you know, satisfaction, trying to find fulfillment in all these different ways, every way imaginable. And ultimately says, none of that works. He's he takes a very Greek approach to it, in other words. And finally he says, wisdom is to accept what God gives you, to do the best you can with it, and acknowledge that he's there. He comes back around to the relationship thing, ultimately. And accepting what, you know, we're, we're, our, what our relationship is with God. But there is a sense in which trying to do it on your own, there was a failing involved. <clears throat> Sin was understood as failure to live up to the covenant obligations. It's not just a, a transgression, an external transgression of the law, but it's literally a rebellion against God. And again, this gets carried on into the teaching of Jesus. This is why the Old Testament is so important. It's so many of the things that you read in the New Testament, so much of you read in Jesus' teaching, you only get part of the picture unless you understand the Old Testament context for it. As David confessed when, when he, um, you know, David said against, in prayer, against you and you only have I sinned to the Lord. He says that to God. Well, you might think he sinned against, you know, Uriah the Hittite by, by stealing his wife and sending him to his death. But no, that was just the symptom. The real failing was a failure of his relationship with God failure to trust and accept. And God says through the prophet Nathan when he sends him to, to David, I've given you everything. You've been my guy. I've made you the king. I've made you wealthy. I have made you victorious over your enemies. I have given you everything <clears throat> as grace, in effect. And still you don't trust me. Still you don't rely on me. You go off and do stuff on your own based on your appetites. And David's response is, against you, God, and you only have I sinned. He is the one chiefly offended in all offenses because all of them are a failure of our relationship with him before they're whatever else they are. And Jesus did the same thing. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity talks about the fact that Jesus, um, you know, Jesus talks about the fact that, that he is the one chiefly offended in all sins. And Lewis says, you know, you trod on my toes... You steal my money and you think I'm the one offended, but Jesus is very clear in saying that he is the one chiefly offended in all offenses. And Lewis points out, that doesn't make any sense at all unless you believe that Jesus was more than just another guy, another man. He was God. The God whose relationship is really the point, not the symptomatic trotting on toes or stealing of money or even of, you know, stealing a wife and having her husband killed. Those are serious problems. Don't, I'm, not, I'm not downplaying that. But they're only symptomatic of the real problem, and that is denial of the relationship with God. So, Old Testament authors, and even though this was often the Hebrew people often interpreted, the Old Testament writers, they understood that, that obedience to the law wasn't really the goal of human existence. That rather it was to be a faithful covenant partner to God. To be true to the things of God. And again, remember, between Abraham, when God first established the covenant, and Moses, when the law was first given, there was no law for 500 years. It was all relationship. It's also true that down through history, the history of the Hebrew people, even when the vast majority of them walked away from God and worshipped other, worshipped other gods and worshipped idols, you know, Solomon, the reason that God was offended at, by Solomon, is that Solomon married all these foreign wives and then allowed and even encouraged them to worship their own gods. He even set up uh, sites for human sacrifice right outside the walls of the city of Jerusalem um, in the Valley of Hinnom. Uh, pretty bad stuff, okay? Even in the worst of times, when the people were following the Baals or uh, the Asherah or the other pagan gods and idols, God always kept a remnant. In fact, there's a whole remnant theology that you can look at in the Old Testament. A lot of books have been written about it. Where no matter what happened, God always ensured that there was a small group of people who stayed true. No matter how far the rest of them went afield. And they became the seed from which the true faith always was able to continue. The same thing has been true in Christianity. Um, no matter how many different cults or sects have gone off in weird directions, 
no matter how many times that even, even the majority of the Christian, um, those who profess to be Christians, have gone off in something we would not call true Christianity, there's always been a core, a remnant, that God would then use to raise back up. Okay? <coughs> Any questions? You guys know you can ask questions as we go along, right? Now, in the worship class, I told you that these things overlap, we talked about the fact that, that the two aspects of worship are remembrance and anticipation. Remembering the great things that God has done in the past, like the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf, and then anticipating what God is going to do in the future. Well, that same thing is reflected in the Hebrew Scripture and is reflected in the Hebrew ethical understanding. Uh, the foundation of Old Testament ethics <clears throat> is based in God's past action. What God did in calling Abraham and establishing the covenant, what God did in bringing the Hebrews up out of the land of Egypt and out of slavery. So the past action established and confirmed Israel as the covenant people of God. But the story did not end and does not end in the past. The Israelites have always had a keen sense of the future and of God having promised renewal. The book of Jeremiah says, a day is coming when I will write my law in your heart. You know, the promise is that the Gentiles will be accepted into the kingdom, which a lot of the Jews were not really keen on at the time. But God is, throughout the Old Testament, there is a promise about what is going to come. Uh, that actually is expressed in the statement, which is true for Christians as well, already but not yet. Our belief, and this is remembrance but anticipation, we already have experienced the grace of God. The Israelites did and all God had done. And we as Christians, and all God had done in the Old Testament, but also in the coming of Jesus and His sacrifice for us. Already, we can remember what God has done, but we anticipate what God has promised He will do in the future. Same thing was true for the Jews in the Old Testament. It is still true for us today. We are very much an extension of the Jewish feeling in that regard. And the eschatological perspective, meaning the end times perspective, what's going to come, is often repeated in the prophets. In fact, you could, as you read the prophets of the Old Testament, their vision, their proclamations are almost always the same thing. It is a call to an ethical response now from the people of Israel and even from the surrounding nations. I mean, some of the, some of the prophets talk about the, the Edomites and Amorites and various other people and how, how they're going to be affected by this as well. But the idea of an ethical response now in preparation for what God is going to do in the future. You know, God is going to deal. He is going to judge. God is going to make things right. You need to straighten up now because of what God is going to do. Now, so it's based upon what God done, has done in the past. We have the context by which we should have ethical conduct. But you need to be ethical now because God isn't done and there is more coming. Remembrance and anticipation. That's fundamental to the understanding of the whole of the Hebrew story uh, and the whole of the Christian story as well. But it is reflective of the ethical expectation. That's We are ethical. We act according to what God desires for us now because of what he's done and because of what he's going to do. Both ends. Now, that meant that present moral decisions had consequences for the future. It's not just what's happening now. And if God doesn't act right now, you know, the prophets said God is going to act, and he may act right now, but if he doesn't act right now, he will respond before the end of the age. Um, so, and often when you look at prophetic literature, it's recognized that there's, uh, for many things, there are dual interpretations. For instance, you know, you read the suffering servant in Isaiah. Well, that had meaning for the Israelites in that day because they had sort of a theology of sacrifice of the innocent for the benefit of everyone. But then we interpret it in the light of what of the coming of Jesus as well. There often is a sort of a multiple timeline interpretation for prophetic things. What has been, what is now, what will be. Okay. The Hebrew people looked for a time when God would act exclusively and decisively on their behalf. And the Jews expected that a time would come when they would rule over all the earth and all the other peoples of the earth would be second, you know, would be under them, that they would be in charge. And the New Testament evangelists declared that God had acted decisively on behalf of the Jewish people and of the other nations of the earth, which he's always promised since Abraham, other nations of the earth would be blessed too, that, they did, that God did so in the coming of Jesus, the coming of his son, that that was the point at which those, that fulfillment 
began, already has been fulfilled, but not yet, because the final consummation is not yet. Jesus has not returned. The already is that Jesus came, and not yet is that Jesus is coming again. All right? Now, for us, the center point of all of our Christian ethics must be the saving act of Jesus. You may not know the word Christological. Christological, it's a theological word. It means to interpret things in light of the Christ having come. Jesus the man, but also Christ the anointed one, the Son of God. So, from a Christological perspective, from the idea that the Son of God came and saved us, we can now understand more specifically what it means to live as God's covenant people, because we inherited that. And you'll remember, Jesus came for the Jews first. When a Samaritan woman um, in, in the land of the Phoenicians approached him and said, my daughter is ill, you can heal her, will you do so? Jesus said, I have to take care of the needs of the children before I can worry about the dogs. Now, the word he used for dog was, was a gentle word, it's like puppy. But he was quite literally saying, I, I came for the Jews first. My first obligation is to the Jews. Well, the, the very smart woman said, well, even the dogs get to collect the crumbs up under the table. And Jesus said, for that answer, your daughter is healed. And she was. So, Jesus came for us too, but he came first for the Jews. We are heirs to the promise that was given to the Jews, as being the covenant people. And that's how all that fits together. That <laughs> whole covenant relationship is the foundation for how we should act, ethically, has continued from the Old Testament into the New Testament. Um, Jesus saw the Hebrew Bible as the primary source for authority in life. He was always quoting it. In fact, the, you know, the New Testament, it's been said that you can almost construct the Old Testament based upon quotes in the New Testament. Jesus said it's easier for, the heaven, for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of the letter of the law to be dropped. He said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. So Jesus did not say, oh, like a lot of Christians do, oh, that's Old Testament stuff. That doesn't have anything to do with us. Jesus looked to the Hebrew Bible as the authority for life, and especially for ethics in life. Um, and in that regard, he especially compared the inadequacy of human tradition, the tradition of the elders, the human interpretations, as being inadequate compared to the truth of God's Word. That is that word reflecting the relationship that God intended for us. This was the basis of all of Jesus' criticisms of the modern, of the, uh, the leaders of the Jewish faith in his time, the scribes and Pharisees especially. That you all have, you're focusing on human traditions, on your interpretations that are not even accurate interpretations, and you've forgotten about God in this whole thing. You've forgotten about the covenant relationship, which is the basis of all of that. Jesus was concerned not with obeying the rules. Now, Jesus did not dispense with um, Jewish tradition. He didn't get rid of the law. He believed in that. But he said that his enemies had misunderstood why God gave the law, what the purpose of the law was, and how it should be interpreted. For instance, Jesus broke the Sabbath. Right? He let his, let his followers pick grains uh, of wheat on the Sabbath and eat them. He healed people on the Sabbath, and the Jewish authorities had a conniption over that. Um, very Jewish word, conniption. Um, and, and yet Jesus said, man was not made for the Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for man. His point was, it's not following the rules that's the important part, it's the context of relationship. You've lost the relationship and you've kept the rules. If you had the right relationship, you'd understand that the rules are not supposed to be oppressive. God gave the Sabbath, a day in which you were not supposed to work, as a way of saying to the people, you shouldn't have to work. 10 hours a day, 7 days a week. You deserve a rest. You deserve some time for thought, for meditation, for prayer, for family. That was a great gift, and yet they had turned it into this oppressive thing. And so Jesus said, if you understood the right relationship with God, then you wouldn't have a problem with the fact that I'm healing people on the Sabbath. Um, there was a very different kind of understanding about that. So Jesus is not a deal at all. Well, Jesus was a deontologist, and he was a consequentialist, and he was a virtue ethicist. A what? Virtue ethicist, meaning virtue being what do you become based upon what you do. Uh, he was all of those things. And in fact, I think we're going to talk about all those, but the conclusion I'm going to draw from all of that is using Jesus as a model. 
is that if we pick one of those and rely on it entirely or even to the vast majority, uh, deny the rest of them, we're not following the model of Jesus and we are not truly being ethical. Okay? People who only follow the rules, the Nazis who committed atrocities in the war and their defense was, but I only, I did what I was told. I was following orders. There's where deontology will take you if you're not careful. Whereas consequentialists would say um, it's they're po the dangerous they turn into situational ethics ethicists where there aren't there is no standards no rules and eventually they deny God because God ends up being a norm and standard outside of the what are the consequences of the case um, and virtue ethics yes we need to be concerned about what this if I make a certain ethical decision what will that do to me how will that you know how will that change me what will it turn me into but the danger there is that all becomes about me. And it's not all about me. So each of those have a, have a positive and they each have a danger. Jesus reflected a balance between those three. A duty orientation, deontology, a consequence orientation, teleological approach, and then also a sense of reflecting who we are by what well, we do. I feel sure that Jesus would have saved a child that was having an asthma attack, mm -hmm. even though the law of the school said no. Right. Okay, um, so the Jews of Jesus' day thought God would reward them for, unscrup for scrupulous, literal observation of the law. But no right of act of righteousness, Jesus said, makes us worthy of God. To Jesus, God's people are not those who appear to be righteous on the surface, but rather those who are penitent, those who are humble um, themselves and who cry for mercy, you know. God rejects the proud but accepts the humble of heart. That's even in the Old Testament. The Jews thought that the ethical life was to satisfy God through strict obedience to the law, following all the rules, versus to be true to the relationship they were supposed to be having with the Heavenly Father, whom we love, trust, and obey with gladness of heart. Not because we have to, not because there are rules and we're going to get in trouble if we don't, but because we want to. You know, a child who obeys their parents because they love their parents and, will, and respect their parents, not because their parents are going to hurt them if they don't. And then for Jesus, the ethical life arises as a response to God's unilateral demonstration of love, grace, and favor, which he has already given freely rather than attempting to win his favor. And in that way, Jesus, very re, in a very real way, reorients the whole direction of ethics. It's not about following the rules. It's about being true to the relationship. Yeah. Well, you see here, you know, we're just experts at, at, at making substitutions. Um, and, you, and you see this same <coughs> idea even today when, when contracts are made or, or agreements are made uh, that there's no trust with the relationship. It has to be written down in paper and sealed by a, right. a notary, you know, because there's just no trust. And it hasn't changed much. No. We have a tendency to just choose the rules and follow the rules rather than, than, than the, what am I looking for, the, the, the big question of relationship. Yeah. And, and Christians are right there too, even amongst other, yeah. with other Christians in his letters to the church in Corinth, in the Corinthians. Um, Paul talks about the fact that you guys are suing each other. Yeah. You know, what is wrong with you? Your brothers and sisters in the Lord and you're taking each other to court? Can you not resolve your differences as brothers and sisters? What is wrong with you? You're letting the legal issues overwhelm the relational issues. Okay, one last slide. Um, the good life versus covenant grace. You will remember that according to Jewish or Jewish, uh, Greek philosophy, that ethics was based upon finding a good life. What does it mean to have a good life? Now that that doesn't just a good life in terms of having a lot of money and a lot of freedom. A good life meant, what does it mean to be good? You know, you can have a lot of money, but if you do so by exploiting children or, or torturing animals, that's not a good life. So the Greeks were, you know, that, that's how they thought of it though. For Jesus, the good life is not the quest for happiness, which is again what, they, what the Greeks talked about, but rather it's the pursuit of God's kingdom. It is a life under God's reign in accordance with his will and accepting of his great love. It is relationship. That's what makes a good life. It's not about me. Um, Jesus summarized God's will for us, his ethical standards, in the double command to love. 
what Rudolf Schnackenberg, again an Old Testament uh, scholar, calls the core and climax of the whole of moral document, doctrine. Rather. Um, the dual commandment is you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. This is the first, first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it that you will love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love your neighbor, the dual commandment. That's the foundation of eth ethics. Those are relational issues, not rule issues. Loving God, being in a relationship with Him, loving your neighbor, being in a relationship with Him and caring about them, as much as you do for yourself. So the central Christian ethical principle is heartfelt love for God, followed immediately by love for others. True citizens, according to Jesus, of the kingdom are those who love God with their hearts and who love others as themselves, as reflected in humble service to both God and neighbor. Jesus said that love is, love is active. We're all about love, 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 I love you. I went to the Crystal Cathedral one time uh, because I was working for um, the continuing education department at the seminary I went to, and we had some, cor some uh, Korean students from the Asian Center for Theological Studies, and they wanted to see various sites around Southern California. They took classes in the morning and the afternoon, and we did stuff. And I took them to the Crystal Cathedral, and they were happy for service. And um, Robert Schuler was there that day, and he said, turn to the person beside you and say, God loves you, and so do I. And I turned to the person beside me, and I smiled and said, God loves you, but I don't even know you. <laughs> because for us, it becomes so cheap. It becomes false. You know, like, love, love, love. All you need is love. Well, what does that mean? What it means is we reflect it in humble service to God and others. Not that the service is the point, the love is the point, the relationship is the point, but you can know if you got it by whether or not you live it. And Jesus manifested that. Again, quoting Rudolf Schneckenberg, the real ground of moral obligation is the perceptible saving act of God in Jesus' coming and activity, his revelation of redemption, which is both historical and eschatological, Remembrance and anticipation. It's in history and it is coming at the end, which guarantees the accomplishment which is to come. So, a question. Um, actually, do I have. Um, well, let me just throw it over. We've got a few minutes here. Questions? I'm just about at the end of my tether here, so, yeah. Is there, is there a, a difference between the Jewish people and the way they approach ethical questions today versus the way Christians do? Yes, very much so. Um, How about an example? Well, it, it, it's very, to say Jews and Christians, there are many different flavors of Jew and there's many different flavor of Christian. If I were to say, um, an Orthodox Jew and an Evangelical Christian, in other words, those who take their faith and the practice of the faith most seriously in both cases, the Orthodox Jew would be very law-oriented, you know, um, would be very much the kind of people that Jesus didn't like very much. Um, they would be concerned about the letter of the law. Um, they would be the ones who insist on wearing a certain kind of clothing that would be absolutely insistent that the, the um, the Sabbath be kept, and that the kosher laws be kept, no exception. And an example of them trying of being legalistic and actually technical about it, it's still common in, in some uh, Orthodox Jewish communities, uh, Hasidic communities and whatnot, in New York and elsewhere, that a lot, of, a lot of them, they'll live in groups, you know, and there'll be a kosher market there, etc. And often they will put in their neighborhood, if there are Jewish families all together in the neighborhood, they'll, they'll set up an aruv wire. You know what an aruv wire is? Well, the Jewish law says that a woman cannot carry her baby outside her own home on the Sabbath. And you cannot, you know, you cannot, you can't carry your baby to the market, you know, you can't, whatever, which means you can't do anything. Well, an aruv wire in a Jewish neighborhood, an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood, they will mount a wire that surrounds, that goes around the street that will encompass a number of different Jewish homes and Jewish markets and things like that. And then they will dedicate that as being their home. Which means it's okay for a woman to carry her baby to the store because the store is technically inside her house. 
because her house is everything that's inside that Aruv wire. There's an example of modern Orthodox Judaism trying to, trying to get around the, the, being focused on the specifics, but then trying to find a way around them by technicalities. Um, and, you know, most liberal Christians would do the same thing, but most evangelical Christians would be focused more on, on the grace part, you know. Carolyn? There are fundamentalist Christians who are... Like Just as legalistic. Pharisaical. And Absolutely. And there are strange rules like the cards or... Exactly. Or yeah. You know, cut your hair. Don't, don't drink. Don't Absolutely drink. right. Yeah. Yeah. There are examples of that in Christians. You know, the, if you... Playing cards is a sin. Going to the movies is a sin. Even if it's a... Dancing, you know, a, 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 dancing is a sin. I had a, a, a... One of my old roommates, Bruce Bowe, was very funny. Uh, hi, Bruce, if you ever watch this. Um, he, Bruce said he went to a very conservative Christian college, and he said that they had an absolute rule <clears throat> against premarital sex because it might lead to dancing. <laughs> um, and so, yes, Christians fall the same way. Uh, other questions? There, there's no simple answer to that because there's all different facts, you know, flavors and gradations, etc. Um, anything else? Your third, your third comment there just reduces it to the very simple. Yep. Ethics takes on just a whole simple thing that's based on loving God and loving your brother. Right, and that's Jesus. there's a reason Jesus said that. All of it is based on relationship, <coughs> not on rules. Now that doesn't, you know, the, the, the rules come later. The rules are a way, and in fact, the rules are a grace. The rules uh, are a way in which God says, well, let me help you understand what that looks like. Here, this will help. But it's only as a reflection of what it should be the foundation, which is the, the grace of God and the relationship that he has offered to us.